Welcome to Recently Locked, where this week, the lines between reality and media are blending. I don't, I don't even know if this is a podcast anymore. I, I don't know what's real. Oh no! Hello. Hi. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like my paranoia isn't translating as well to the to audio. I feel I feel like you really need the visuals. Yeah. To... Make, I was making paranoid faces. Wow. <laughs> my my words were wavering. His his acting lessons they were like make a face of paranoia agent. Whoa. Well, now it sounds like we were supposed to be talking about paranoia agent. <laughs> well, you know, you could you could give vague descriptions like that, That's and true. you could be talking about either one at this point. You could be talking about basically any of Satoshi Khan's works, Micah. Well, not, not all mean, of them. Perfect Blue. Not like Millennium Perfect Actress. Blue, the, no, Millennium Actress, the lines really? between reality well, that's true. and media but are paranoia blending. paranoia is not as say, much of a I thing. I was about to say, Perfect Blue, <laughs> it, it's not media. Like, the lines between reality are blending, but it's not, like, specifically media. I mean, she is an actress. Well, she's, she's not. She's, she was, becomes an actress. <laughs> she, was a, she was an idol pop star. It's right? true. It's true. <laughs> but yes, hello. Um, here we are. We're here we here are. To talk about movies yet again. Heck yeah! After a brief hiatus. A brief hiatus. Which it seems to be a recurring trend. Well, I'm. I sure am working a lot. <laughs> right. Work, working hard or hardly working. Working hard, hardly working. Right. And I'm working hard. He's working hard. <laughs> Not unlike the protagonist of this week's film, like a whoa. A, a little ditty called Paprika. Why? Is that why we were talking about Satoshi Khan <laughs> films? It is. It, I mean, we talk about Satoshi Khan films even when we're not talking about Paprika. My mind is only filled with Satoshi <laughs> Khan films. Rightfully so. Um, probably one of the best directors uh, Japan has no, no, like given no, no, us. No, no, no. You've, you've, you've gone too far. It's no? not probably, and it's not Japan. He's one of the best, <laughs> one of the best ever. directors ever. Period. I mean, yeah, probably. And I stand by that. It, if if not, if you know if you disagree with that, <laughs> he's one of the best writers ever. Ah, man, he really does write such so, great screenplays. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're talking about Paprika this week, which hopefully uh, you've seen before. And if you haven't, if you go haven't, watch it. watch Paprika. If you're okay with the comedy. Yeah, it can be a little disturbing. It's a little intense, a little disturbing, but if you can stomach it, I think it's worth it because it's a very good movie. It's like a masterpiece. Um, but we're gonna but be, that's kind of spoilers for say, what we're going to talk we're gonna about. We're going to talk more about our opinions <laughs> later on. First, uh, let's tell the people what they need to know about Paprika. Let's... All right, so again, we're talking about Paprika, which is a 2006 film. It is rated R. Rated, rated R. R. Mm -hmm. It is an hour and 30 minutes. Its little IMDb description is, when a machine <laughs> that allows therapists to enter their patients' dreams is stolen, all hell breaks loose. Only a female therapist, Paprika, can stop it. There you go. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the plot of Paprika. Oh, wow, there's like a paragraph long plot description too you know on the on the official like sony classics website they had a press kit for paprika that i read through and they have like a full-on like almost scene by scene breakdown of what happens in the movie i'm like this is crazy this wow is, this is a bit much well now i'm going to try my gosh darn hardest to not butcher these japanese names and i'm so sorry of these very talented filmmakers, very very right? talented filmmakers <laughs> actors writers right bear bear with me we try we we, we did look up we made we made an effort at we've least we've made efforts uh <laughs> so we have in the cast uh megumi hayashibara okay. megumi hayashibara <laughs> i can't speak <laughs> i can't even speak normally so i am trying to pronounce very long syllable words and that's going well right uh toro imari uh Katsunosuke Hori. And again, forgive me for all of these. I guarantee <laughs> I'm butchering these. Right. And uh, Toru Furuya. 
And that is as far as I'm going to attempt. <laughs> this is the, this is the I mean, main, that's, that's the main cast. It's a pretty small cast, you know, yeah. as far as animated films go. Uh, directed by Satoshi Kon, uh, you know, the best. <laughs> uh, did you want to mention, though, Remy? Oh, right. Um, there's yeah. additional direction. I, I didn't have it pulled up, but I will pull it, have it now. Pulled up. Um, additional direction by Masayashi Ando. Yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and then it was written, the novel that it's based on was written by Yashutaka Susui. Um, and the screenplay was written by Saishi Minakami, I think, and Satoshi yeah. Kon. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to mention, Remy? Uh, other than the fact that it's a great movie? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I guess... Isn't this Satoshi Kon's like last film that he worked on? This is. This is the very last film he made before he died. I was about to say that's that's something to mention. I think um, he's had a very um, like highly acclaimed career, um, and like this is the ending of that. And a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but this is generally one of his more successful films. Yeah, this was, this, was, this was like his most acclaimed yeah. and money-wise successful film. Exactly. Um, here, I'm actually doing something real quick. So, okay. So, talk. Uh, yeah, Satoshi Kon. I, I think I believe I've seen all of his films now, besides a couple of his short films and like some of his TV work that he did. Um, but this is my my personal favorite of his of his catalog, uh, besides maybe Paranoia Agent. But that's not a film. Uh, we've considered actually covering Paranoia Agent before on the podcast, um, but. It's a bit of a bigger undertaking since it's a bit longer than a normal like feature project. Though, if you want to hear uh, <laughs> super neat um, <laughs> opinions on it, I did an entire YouTube video on it. Yeah, um, I, I feel like I don't know. I don't know what else to mention. I watched a cool featurette about the adaptation of the original book that Paprika is based on to like movie form, uh, and it covered a lot of Satoshi Kon's like. Uh, process for not only like storyboarding a lot of this movie but also like what sort of narrative threads should be adapted into like the actual movie itself which i think is really interesting um because it, it takes a smart like writing team and animation team to adapt a novel as long as the one this is based on into a 90 minute movie well, um, I did all of that while you were stalling <laughs> yeah. uh, to calculate, because in its box office stuff, it has uh -huh. its budget in uh, JPY, which is Japanese yen. Yes. Um, and then its gross and worldwide gross in American dollars. Oh. <laughs> so, just converting it. Yeah, but it, it's not quite accurate, mm -hmm. um, because it's 2006 I mean, inflation money. too, yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to figure out the exact value. You can't <laughs> exactly do it, rate, yeah. but it seemed to make quite a bit of money. Yeah, which no. is which is good. Um, and even on the featurette that I watched, they were talking about how this was probably his most like successful film. Oh, it definitely and one was. of his biggest films ever. A lot of his films, especially because they didn't have as wide of American releases, and that just wasn't really mm -hmm. there. There wasn't as big of a market for that kind of thing in like the early like late '90s. It really only became a thing in the late '90s, early 2000s yeah. that American audiences would even want to watch an anime movie <laughs> yeah um so this was coming around like right in 2006 and it was co-produced in like an, in america i think yeah um what is what is the studio that the we're studio talking? monster uh, monstrous no, no, no. it's something like that uh well the one studio remember. madhouse madhouse that is is a, an american jap like a japanese <laughs> yeah, american studio. madhouse yeah um so it had a pretty wide American release as, uh, as well as a pretty big Japanese release. Yeah, um, if I'm remembering correctly, it premiered at the Venice Film Festival the year it came out and then got uh, picked up by a lot of other film festivals like as it was initially releasing. So it got a lot of wide distribution just from its festival circuit, which is pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think <laughs> that probably went on way longer because I was arbitrarily trying to find out how much say, money it made. Longest, our longest basic facts <laughs> segment ever. But I think that's all you need to know. The moral of the story is it's a very, 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 very cool piece of history yeah. in the career of Satoshi Kon, an amazing, super influential and important Japanese animator and just in that in industry in general, director mm -hmm. and writer. Absolutely. Um, so now let's get into talking about the film itself. Let's do it. All 
All right, so Robbie. Yes. Are my my amazing co-host, brother, wow, friend, friend, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the animated film known as Paprika? Known as Paprika. I think that it's very very good. As I mentioned, I think in the basic facts segment, it's like one of my favorite films ever. I think I said that it was my my favorite Satoshi Kon film. Uh, but it also that also means that it's one of my favorite <laughs> films ever uh, because I'm a big fan of his work. Uh, it kind of feels like a very cool amalgamation of a lot of the things he's touched on in previous projects. Very much is. Um, a lot of the way this film like flows visually feels like a good step up and like a good continuation of stuff he's doing in like Perfect Blue where a lot of the visual like threads carry from scene to scene and shot to shot, that sort of thing. Uh, it's one of his most visually ambitious films, uh, which I really appreciate. Uh, the art direction's amazing. I really like that. Uh, I love it's kind of like, I don't know, like almost tongue in cheek usage of other film genres and the forms that those tend to like bring with them. Uh, the way like the visuals morph as we move through different dream styles and I don't know. It, it's it's just a very mesmerizing film to watch. And on top of that, I think it has a lot of thematic depth and emotional depth that I I didn't I didn't fully attach to on the first viewing, uh, but on the second viewing, I really really enjoyed. Which I mean, I I obviously really was entertained by it on the first <laughs> viewing. Uh, Inception is one of my favorite uh, like films. It was one of the films that kind of sparked my interest in like filmmaking. Um, so obviously Paprika has, I don't know, the, the parallels have been drawn a lot between them. It's not like that. Yeah, they're, overt, they're really but, not that yeah, similar. Yeah, they're not that similar, but, but um, it's worth mentioning. Inception, yeah. like, because um, Inception came out after. Correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. about to say, it came out in 2010, <laughs> I think. Yeah. And it, uh, like, there's a lot it of draws specific visual plot. references. Yeah, some visual references. Like, it was, it was, a, it was directly an inspiration for... Uh, Christopher Nolan, but it really isn't that similar no, outside that of like, similar. oh, they're going into people's dreams. I just think I just think it's really cool that um, one of my favorite movies is influenced by one of my favorite movies. Well, dude, if you go in and look at his career, man, yes, the amount of Satoshi Khan's career, yeah, the amount of influence his movies had on not like not even just Japanese cinema, but American cinema is pretty oh, yeah. crazy. No, I was about to say his, um, like the way he goes about writing uh, thrillers and dramatic movies is pretty revolutionary, even in his first movie, which is Perfect Blue. Yeah, and a lot of the of... most ambitious thrillers I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of his cinematic language and everything oh, in yeah. his films um, is really, really fascinating. And, you know, when Satoshi Kon first got his start in animation, because that's what he started in, that's what most animation directors <laughs> start in, yeah. is, that, you know, animating. Yeah. Um, but while he was at school for, like, animation and everything, he, like, stopped watching animated films and only watched is really... like all of the classics and like all of the movies yeah. he could track down for like classic staples of cinema you can really and tell <laughs> like that oomph that it gave his career knowing like cinematic language and style yeah. and not only that but just knowing cinematic history and what is associated with what yeah gives him so much power especially in something like paprika which Absolutely. is grabbing so much from cinematic history i was about to say we get at least two um that i caught uh like explicit references to like kurosawa movies yeah, yeah there's there's a lot of references to a heck of a mm -hmm. lot of movies in yeah this. which i was about to say another reason i really love paprika is because satoshi khan gets to like flex his like filmmaking prowess a lot more and you know kind of revel in how how much he loves the art form that he's yeah. producing this in it was a really really fantastic pairing of like story with yeah. The director yeah absolutely no i i can't imagine anyone else doing this movie uh but yeah no what did you what did you rate it i rated it if you can even believe it a five out of five would, 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 i wah? don't think it's necessarily perfect but i do think that it's about as close as you can get it's not perfect blue really it's not perfect blue. well hold on now i think <laughs> i well 
<laughs> this is not about perfect boy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I gave it a five out of five. What do, what do you think of Paprika, Micah? Well, I mean, obviously I really love it too. Uh, it was not out of Satoshi Kon's work specifically, which is kind of what I'm going to be judging this on because mm-hmm. like, you know, if I compare it to a lot of other movies, I'm like, oh, it's, yeah, it's like way better it's, than all the... <laughs> yeah, it, as, as a standard goes, Satoshi, uh, so even the worst Satoshi Kon movie is like really, really good. <laughs> yeah. So like, especially in comparison to a lot of his films, it wasn't my favorite on the first time mm-hmm. around. I just didn't really connect with it emotionally. Yeah. But I definitely was just in awe of what this film is doing because it really is like Satoshi Kon getting paired with a story that's so perfect for him mm-hmm. where they both worked really closely together and were able to just like make essentially a love letter to movies and to what Satoshi Kon had done with his career yeah. and all of his interests and also a lot of his similar themes that had been going through about his worries about like technology and society mm-hmm. and how we were progressing, which are always like really super cool themes in my opinion. Yeah. And it touches on the like on them on here in a really, really profound way, I think. Yeah. Uh, so especially on a second time around, when I was able to process those a bit more, mm-hmm. it was like I was like, wow, this is this is doing something really special it feels i actually i would say like it's gotten even more relevant as time has marched on from 2006 which which like paranoia (laughs) agent is the same way like he like those two movies which are largely about technology i mean heck perfect blues the same way Mm -hmm. for what it's about he was just like he's a really really smart writer (laughs) yeah (laughs) um but man, and like the the style of this is so unique that it makes it such an interesting watch because it it's arguably his most bubbly film. Yeah. But it really is one of his darkest and a lot of its imagery and a lot of the things that actually go on in the film. Yeah, right. And besides like again, like Paranoid Agent, oh man, <laughs> that's a dark project. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> my goodness. But it, it just makes all in all for this kind of dreamlike experience. What? Uh, that just feels like you're watching something extremely special that just has so much love and talent poured into it. Right. It's visually astonishing. Yeah. And you know, it's it's really great. Um, it's a great movie, yeah. <laughs> I gave it a five out of five. Wow. Um, a unanimous perfect score from the recently logged duo. Who would have thought? <laughs> On my Satoshi Khan <laughs> ranking, though, this is how my Satoshi Khan okay. ranking goes. Okay. At the number one, I have Paranoia Agent. Go check out my video to hear why. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a TV show. I guess it doesn't count. Shush. <laughs> it's on Letterboxd. It is. At on number Letterboxd. two, I have Perfect Blue. Perfect because blue. it's just as good as Paprika, but I like it better. Mike is like Satoshi Khan peaked in his first movie. <laughs> <laughs> At number three, I have Paprika. At number four, I have Millennium Actress, which I also gave I it a really five need out of to five. Watch Millennium Actress, dude. Uh, at number five. I have Magnetic Rose. Okay, that's a short film. It's like. 45 minutes already. <laughs> it's 45 minutes. It is, it is. It's the best thing in memories, too. And I didn't rate it, because it's a short film. It's a short film. <laughs> and then at number six, still really, really good, we have Tokyo Godfathers, Dude, Tokyo Godfathers which I gave rules. a three and a half. And yeah. it's, just, it's just not like my thing. Yeah. It's still really fantastic, but it's, uh, it's the one I connect with the least out of any of his work. Which is fair. Uh, I, I suppose I should give my ranking now. Um, I, I guess I would go Paprika number one. I don't. I don't have like a set <laughs> list <laughs> like you do. Uh, paprika number one for sure. Uh, if I were to include Paranoia Agent, I suppose it would be either one or two. I don't know. Um, then Perfect Blue. Uh, then probably Millennium Actress. Uh, and I, I, it's pretty similar, like to your ranking, because I think Tokyo Godfather is why I, I, I like it a bit more than you do. Yeah. Uh, I still think it's probably a bit worse than Millennium Actress. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, it, it, we're pretty similar rankings. Where, where's Magnetic Rose, Remy? Magnetic Rose. Uh, I don't know. Magnetic Rose is like a masterpiece. I would probably actually put that <laughs> above, uh, Tokyo or not tokyo godfather's millennium actress yeah dude magnetic so like right under perfect fantastic. blue fantastic and yeah. that was like his first time being able to like he wrote it he didn't direct it but that was like underneath like the studio <laughs> and director who mentored him uh this was like the first That's time they let piece, him man. they let him on the screenplay <laughs> and it's crazy my goodness <laughs> yeah that man the like atmosphere and emotion and that Jeez, in magnetic yeah. rose is crazy <laughs> <laughs> but 
do you have an opening question to get us deeper into the actual film of Paprika? Uh, yeah, sure. You mentioned uh, it kind of being, I don't, I don't remember how specific you got in your like interpretation of what Paprika is generally about, but um, I suppose my question would be, uh, what, it, what were your like main takeaways from Paprika? Because I, I think it's a, a very dense film with a lot yeah. of a lot of subtext that you can pull from, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, I would just be curious what your main takeaway would be. Yeah, I think it's I think it's very if interesting. you had one. <laughs> um, and I did have a, I did have a main takeaway because a lot yeah. of it, um, and you can grab a couple of different things. I mean, you could grab Absolutely. a ton from you this because it's just such a well written movie. Yeah. Uh, but one of the big things that I grabbed from it on my second watch, especially, was just like the unrestricted nature of technology and mm -hmm. the direction where we're heading with the internet and the connections that we have uh, lead society and humans essentially to highlight everything that's like their worst tendencies right. and magnifies them to an extreme to almost an um, absurd degree yeah, yeah to to an absurd degree yeah. to the point where we don't really know how to interact with other humans yeah one of the things that consistently happens throughout the film is like you know they'll get kind of taken over by the like the main villain mm -hmm. will like essentially infect their mind while they're dreaming yeah and they essentially just can't interact with anyone else anymore they're just in literally in their own world yeah. not able to like see beyond their own fantasy yeah and get even wrapped up into somebody else's right um and it's very interesting and then you also have kind of the dueling theme going on inside the movie which is i think a lot about like the fact that art is kind of what ties us back to each other mm -hmm. yeah uh, especially movies obviously because satoshi <laughs> khan is a movie man yeah um but kind of that movies and making art especially with people can connect us to our past and to people we may not even like know very well i was about to say the inspector character i um his emotional thread in this like his ability to complete a work of art that had remained like unresolved in his past um like through his dream yeah, is, that, is like one of the most powerful things. I was things. about to say that connected him with an yeah. old friend that he had pretty much forgotten about. Exactly. Who, like yeah. tragically passed away. No, it's one of the, one of the most beautiful like resolutions I can think of. <laughs> yeah. So I was about to say, you kind of have these dueling so, themes uh, going on for a lot of the movie between the connections to art and even the scientist, I forget his mm -hmm. name, trying to make something in like the way his character goes about and what he's actually attempting yeah. versus what it actually means than the difference between art and technology yeah no man uh, so it's a very um like small cast but i'm surprised at how like well defined and well like rounded all of the characters are in in the main bit and i mean paprika i think is a really like i don't know the, the like duality of paprika and um I don't know any of the characters' names. I feel so bad. <laughs> who are um, you? Who are you looking for? The main, the main, um, like the lead of the movie, the main scientist. Oh, uh, yeah. Atsuko. Yes, um, but like the duality of her character is really, I don't know, meaningful. A lot of the movie, I think, is about having a healthy balance, like between, um, basically, like dreams and art, and like. At your actual life yeah or even or even like technology and yeah art, exactly or technology and your personal self well i think one of the most um like evocative images from this movie that a lot of people know it for is like the like endless parade of stuff yeah um which again i think is a very good indicator that it could possibly be about the internet <laughs> or well, at least technology yeah um, the endless parade of constant just more and more absurd and exactly, extreme yeah. stuff. I was about to say, you get all of these like little trinkets and knickknacks from a, tons of different cultures that have just been kind of piled together and they're all marching along going nowhere, essentially. <laughs> yeah, just jam-packed, yeah. pulling anything in its path exactly, and like, yeah. combining it into its system. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's such a... There, there's so many images in this movie that are so like moving to me when yeah. I see them. I'm I like, mean, a oh lot of goodness. a lot of that's what's something yeah. that makes this so unique is a lot of the specific like storytelling is told just in straight just visuals. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the nuances and themes are pretty much only communicated through visuals because like 
the story on the whole is pretty like quote unquote basic like it's a very easy story to track even if it can be kind of confusing i was about to say you got the chairman you got the um stolen uh headset i'm forgetting the name of them now for the dc mini yeah the dc mini you got the stolen dc mini um it's connecting a bunch of dreams uh it's like causing like a collapse in reality kind of thing yeah you got the guy who was obsessed (laughs) with uh the main scientist who made it Mm -hmm. and you got the guy who was obsessed with the chairman exactly no, it's a very it's a very simple like plot thread to follow, even if it plays out in a very interesting like mystery way. Yeah, um, it's a lot easier to follow when you've seen it twice. <laughs> yeah. I would very much recommend watching it twice so your brain can have a chance to even take in like a a tenth of what you're watching. <laughs> yeah, no, I a lot of reviews that I um like read in preparation for this episode were talking about how it's a very rewarding film to revisit over and over again. Well, dude, when you see <laughs> like, dude, like the second time around, if you watch similar to something like paranoid agent, like he does something similar mm-hmm. to help create a good sense of tension. Uh, but that geisha doll design oh that the one goodness, character dude. takes place in, um, like he, he <laughs> can be consistently found in the background of so many of the shots. That's so, it's just, still so crazy. And he's got a really menacing design. Right. So like, I would just be, I would spend like half the time on my rewatch of this. I was just looking in the <laughs> just background. Just looking for Because the I mean, there are so many neat details. Like yeah. all of these frames, if you look at a single frame of this movie, it is jam packed with stuff. Had you, in a really visually, yeah. like good way yeah had you seen how satoshi khan storyboards uh, I, I hadn't seen any of his storyboards I, until i, I watched have seen that his, feature yeah ad. i've seen some of his but storyboards he, his storyboards are so detailed yeah it's crazy i'm like it really speaks to how much like i think satoshi khan is like the auteur of paprika as as dumb as that can seem for yeah. some projects he really did like so much of the visual idealization and like story threads well and again a lot of a lot of the way he storyboards comes from his background because like i mean he started as an animator and he also produced a manga and like he did the art for it so he's very much like that's what he does yeah i was kind of shocked at how detailed so much of the storyboarding was for this film which i mean plays to it because you could do a film with a similar idea and mm-hmm. it could look so ugly like so much of this is about, just jam-packed with stuff yeah he brought up like a specifically if you remember the um taxi scene with the uh head guy like the head scientist guy and um the main character they're sitting in like the taxi while it's raining and he's explaining like the shared dreams and everything yeah. He was like, uh, Satoshi Khan, he was like, you could shoot this in a very basic way, just do like shot, reverse <laughs> shot kind of thing. He was like, but then I noticed like the raindrops on the window. He's like, it's a perfect visual uh, visualization of what they're talking about. So you end up getting like, um, like the shot of her face and then you get I was this long say, which take a... of like the raindrops running together and then it like kind of smashes into this image of the guy reacting like in the car it's crazy i was about to say which if you've seen that scene yeah. like you very clearly remember that that's mm-hmm. a really visually powerful moment and it's just two people sitting in a car <laughs> that's the kind of just yeah this movie like literally and everything is like that you yeah any given scene is like that and they just make the smartest decisions yeah. like every single time visually on what to do with this movie yeah it's you such could, a it's such a well shot movie i think you could think the story of this is annoying and garbage <laughs> but i think you have to respect just how crazy well this has been like shot and animated mm-hmm. the amount of thought and attention and visual storytelling that went into this is is just almost beyond comprehension i was actually going to mention how great the um editing is a mm-hmm. lot of this like yeah. the, the atmosphere the sound design um and just general rhythm that the movie has is really impressive to me um it it's it's hard to do <laughs> oh interesting uh let me what see if it? i can try and pronounce his name oh, okay uh takashi Sayama, I think is how you say his name. Okay. Maybe. Uh, he was a co-editor on this, and he is, like, the main editor for Ghibli. And, oh, wow, like, like Studio Ghibli? Yeah, like... Oh, yeah, I remember I remember looking him up, actually, and noticing that he had a ton of Ghibli credits to yeah. his name. I'm like, man, no wonder it's well edited, Yeah, you know? and then the other, the other editor, Yumi Jingjugi, I think... I think is how you would say that. Okay. Uh, has not been on much. So yeah, like, it was just a couple of TV shows and everything. Interesting. Um, so, but man, together they, 
crazy. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because a lot of his team wasn't his normal team for this one. Not going really. through going through Madhouse and being under That's true, yeah. Um and being under Masa if I can <laughs> speak his name properly. Yeah, yeah. Masayo uh Takayami, mm-hmm. which again was his like one of his big helps throughout a lot of his career. Yeah. Um being under him with Madhouse again. Um, it brought in a very interesting, like, creative team and a lot of actually, like, people who hadn't really worked on much before yeah. working on this, which is crazy again. <laughs> yeah, imagine this being, like, one of your first films that you got to work on. <laughs> that would be crazy, man. But yeah, no, it's super impressive. What, were, what, what was the question that spawned all this? Oh, right. What was the takeaway? <laughs> your takeaway of, of the film. What is your, I mean, I don't know. I feel like we kind of covered <laughs> yeah, your takeaway. I, gener- I generally really, agree. It's yeah. not really a reverse question we can do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of a good question. Um, oh yeah. I want to dive into this more. What do you think of like, again, um, paprika and kind of, um, uh, Atsuko as like a character. I don't know. It's it's a very interesting lead for a movie, I think. Um, not that it's, like, unconventional or anything, but I think the, like, kind of split nature between, like, her two sides is at least very fun to watch, but it... I don't know. I don't know. What am I trying yeah, to say a lot, Yeah, because that's actually something that, <laughs> yeah. I, that I felt a little unprepared to talk about, mm-hmm. is one of the aspects of this film is a lot of its, like power dynamic and yeah. like, sexual dynamic energy going I was about to say that. There's a lot of sexual overtones to a lot of the scenes in this movie, even, even like the ones you wouldn't expect yeah, necessarily. Like, yeah, and even like the chairman and what's-his-face, mm-hmm. like, they're, like, again, which is why it get, leads into some of the more disturbing content of the film. Yeah. Um, but, like, there's very clearly the theme of, like, sexual power dynamics going on throughout yeah. the movie. Um, but I didn't really have, like, a, in yeah. this viewing anyway, a clear grasp or, like, a big takeaway from that. It's bold of you to assume that I was. <laughs> well, I was just hoping. You um, know? Yeah, no, I. Because it is a major part of the film. It is, yeah. It's a part of the film that I haven't really, like, come up with a like solution in quotes for um but it does it it adds a very interesting like layer of tension to a lot of the scenes that otherwise wouldn't be there um but i don't necessarily have like a well there's a very yeah there's a very interesting takeaway between um atsuko and paprika Mm -hmm. whereas atsuko is like a very like she's a hard-working woman yeah she's very like professional very closed off from yeah. people. I yeah. mean, there's even the whole thing with her relationship as part of her character arc. Yeah. Um, so that's like there. And then you have Paprika, who is this character who is almost always given this kind of like sexual imagery paired along with her. Almost all of the men think of her in that way. Yeah, exactly. Um, and she kind of engages with them in that way. Yeah. And that's kind of like part of what she does as her therapy. Um, and that's a very interesting like aspect that I don't have yeah. like, a solid takeaway from yet. No, it is it is very interesting because it kind of, I don't know, it kind of almost makes like her therapy as like it draws a parallel between her therapy and like art almost. Um, again, the dreamscape thing being, you could read it as a metaphor for movies yeah, and, and media, that I'd, sort of thing. I'd even seen like an interpretation of part of it as like a lot of people's relationship to like female artists mm-hmm. and even especially leaning towards more like sex workers and stuff. Interesting. Especially on the internet. Yeah. And the kind of unhealthy power and relationship dynamics that can take place between relationships between somebody creating an art form for you to engage with mm-hmm. versus you thinking it's like a personal thing yeah and a lot of that draws into a lot of the ways people specifically interact with paprika because paprika is not personable with anyone like pretty much straight up throughout the entire movie except for the inspector Mm -hmm. she doesn't like she is personable with them in the fact that she like treats them like clients yeah um but all of the men in the movie talk about her like they're like essentially somebody they were in a relationship with. Yeah, yeah. And they deal with her as such. And it's very interesting. Like, I had had read a review talking about their kind of interpretation of Paprika as kind of playing into the kind of internet age of sex work. 
Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very, I think that's a good, like a good thing to grab from it. I don't know if you could say it's like the definitive thing, obviously. Well, yeah, especially being like with one of the, Mm. one of the main like antagonists of the film, entire motivation to be, to branch that crossing between like not able to interact with her and essentially try and take her through Uh, the digital space. Yeah, to like own her. Exactly. Yeah. No, I thought I I really do like the um like villains of this movie. I always forget that they're there until <laughs> until they pop up again because they're off screen for a, like a pretty good majority. Yeah, because a lot of, a lot of this movie is a mystery. And yeah, it's just doing. If you've noticed, if you haven't watched the movie and you're hearing <laughs> us talk about this, and you're like, "Wow, this is all over the place." Yeah, that's because there's so much that actually is in this movie. Yeah, there's, there's a like lot three of stuff. three antagonists. Um, yeah. Plus, like, the overarching theme really has more of an antagonist than them. Yeah, there's, like, there's... the antagonistic force of the DC Mini itself, you know? There's, like, the there's all of the different scientists, the relationships, there's Atsuko, and there's Paprika. They're, Same person, yeah, but they're, they're kind of doing, yeah. doing different things. <laughs> and then there's the filmmaking inspector mm-hmm. who's trying to unlock the past that he's forgotten about when he forgot about making films and his old friend. Yeah. And, like, they're, there's a lot <laughs> going on in this movie. Like I said, it's a very dense movie. And that's something I really admire it for. Because it manages to be really, really dense, like, in its themes and narratives and characters without feeling, uh, like, muddy or unenjoyable. Yeah. Which would be a big worry for me. Like, it was going into this. I'm like, this is a lot to tackle <laughs> in just one movie, and they somehow managed to do it. I don't... They made it very fun to watch at the same time. Yeah. I actually wanted to mention one more thing, too, of yeah. the... Like, with the theme I was talking about, about, like, the sexual power dynamics yeah. and everything. Yeah. I always just thought about the the rather provocative imagery with, um, like, when the chairman starts to split into the one guy, mm-hmm. and, like, they start to try and, like, fight over control and yeah. consuming each other. It's a very, very interesting, like, visual use for kind of how their power dynamic works yeah. and connecting yeah. it back to, like, what what's-his-face had to do to get involved in the entire thing. Um, exactly, Which yeah. also, again, ties back to sex. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah, I was about to say, more so than me having, like, a grand... Uh, thesis statement or something, um, which again you can apply. Uh, you can apply a lot of different critical lenses to Paprika and get a lot of different things out of it. Yeah, I was about to say. But I really admire just how dense and rich and cohesive it all is. Yeah, like my big takeaway on this last watch, mm-hmm. which wasn't my main takeaway on the first <laughs> watch, was again about like the internet and the yeah. way that that like has made us interact with each how other. How it's kind of and, corroded our humanity. And the way, well, yeah. even just our relationships and our abilities exactly, to yeah. communicate. Um that that was my really powerful takeaway, but there are like a million other takeaways <laughs> you could have from this right. depending on like who you are and what mood you're in and how many times you've watched the movie. Yeah. I, like I said, you can, you can apply so many different lenses to it and come out with a very clear and well-defined like takeaway, which is, which speaks so very strongly, not only to the story it's pulling from, but mm-hmm. also just the adaptation. Yeah. Um, it's integrity as a whole piece of art is crazy to me. <laughs> yeah. Cause if anything, man, Satoshi Khan knows how to adapt a book. Like really <laughs> he knows how to adapt yeah. a book. Yeah. Um, if you have the, um, the Sony classics Blu-ray release for Paprika, which might be the only one I didn't, I didn't look I think, into I it. I think it is the only release. Yeah, probably. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but there's a great featurette, um, talking about how they adapted the book. Um, cause it's, it's actually a pretty decently long book. Yeah. Um, and they adapted, uh, really, I think, I think the author said like it's spirit really well that he yeah. said they dropped a lot of the, um, like kind of nuances of it but managed to create a more powerful short version of yeah, it. Yeah, again through a lot of its visual language especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he he said he it, like seeing Paprika in its final form has kind of confirmed to him that like that book was kind of his opus. He he claimed <laughs> it was his most entertaining and like well-rounded work of yeah. his books. So, but uh no, I mean it ties back to like even even again Perfect Blue which mm-hmm. was Satoshi Kon's first thing he was he he approached the author of the book perfect blue yeah and he wanted to adapt it 
and he started writing and working on it and he pretty quickly was like wow because he you know the contract he got because he was the first time director mm -hmm. and what they did he didn't really have a lot of creative control he was making like a straight adaptation which as is close as very he hard get. to do um and he was like wow this is just not it not so he a good movie he, yeah. he appealed to the author and was like hey can i can i like change this can i make this my own thing make it better mm -hmm. as a movie and the author let him he there was you like go. you only have to keep these couple things Thank the goodness, same in the man. book <laughs> and he was he completely reworked so much of the actual like minutia of the story mm -hmm. to work again in a visual way i think it's very interesting if thinking about a lot of his work especially perfect blue but yeah. even paprika is this is a similar way there's a lot more dialogue in paprika but yeah. he's very very good at using dialogue not only in a super smart way but like not using dialogue in a very smart way. Yeah, no, I was actually going to mention that um, when I mentioned, I think I mentioned like the parade and the atmosphere of the movie a lot, but a lot of the scenes that I remember um, like that stick out in my mind very vividly don't have hardly any dialogue. Yeah, I mean, he, that's that's a very big thing with Satoshi Kon's writing in general. I mean, yeah. if you look at his films, they they just don't have that much like they have a lot of dialogue yeah. but they don't like rely heavily on just everyone talking to each other yeah they're not they're not like super uh like exchange heavy movies typically yeah i was about to say perfect blue is the biggest example because it's all about like isolation and <laughs> yeah. everything so yeah. she's not really talking to very many <laughs> people for most of the many, movie <laughs> too many people <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was about to say, at least with Paprika, you get um, a lot of the main like scientific team uh, interacting a lot. Um, you get quite a few scenes of them hanging out or um, like trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah, there's there's pretty consistently like talking yeah, going on yeah. until you go into a lot of the dream sequences. And even then, there's still a lot. But I just like especially think of the way he writes his dialogue and the times he chooses to pull back on dialogue mm -hmm. are very very interesting and work really well with the tone and the pacing. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's like I said, I Paprika is one of my favorite movies and every time I approach it like having seen like a, a movie that inspires me or something, I'll I'll come back to Paprika and I'll be able, I'll see something new in it and I'll be like, "Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that's pretty crazy actually." No, it's just I think I feel like that's just Satoshi Kon's work. Yeah. And I don't like I know we've been talking <laughs> about like Satoshi Kon a lot as a whole, but really this was like his his thing this was his last film this was the one that he let himself be like even more fully himself i was about to say and even it reflects if, so much on the rest of yeah his career. even if you don't think it's his best movie i would claim it to be his opus probably in terms of movie yeah I, in terms of his as as a filmmaker i think this is his opus because he lets himself loose so much in as a visual storyteller yeah and i was about director. to say in in paranoia agent he lets himself go even more loose with yeah. the actual episodic structure but in this this is a perfect combination of a lot of those more wild ideas mm -hmm. that he liked that he got he was able to tap into exactly in paranoia agent paired with a very very sharp and like very i can't even think of another word besides sharp but just concise story yeah. no it's a it's a very um that, like I said, very impressive uh, adaptation of a of a rather lengthy novel um, yeah. into a ninety minute movie, and it somehow manages to be, uh, like super, like I, I what am I looking for here? <laughs> like nutritional? I don't, that's the wrong <laughs> word for <laughs> nutritional. What are you going for here? Right? Very rich, like in in text. Very nutritional. nutritional. It really, it really remembered to take its vitamins. <laughs> no, like artistically nourishing. Does that make sense, Micah? <laughs> <laughs> it does make sense but yeah but nutritional was just a very funny way to put it <laughs> but yeah um i i really do think this is probably his uh, opus as a filmmaker um you could I, I could very easily see an argument for paranoia agent being like his opus as a writer yeah which um, i made that argument yeah. in my video <laughs> Uh, but I think as a filmmaker, as a, yeah, as a director, as a director. movie, yeah, even more as a director, because mm -hmm. I don't think even, I don't think Paranoia Agent is like his best direction. No. I think, but it is. I, I mean, do it's think, good. I do think it is. I, I do think it is his best and most impressively written work. Yeah. Um, but I think this is like his direction magnum opus this is his film i was about to say uh actually when we were watching the opening sequence of paprika this on the second watch we were like wow this is so just like distinctly him 
like yeah, you, you could watch like it. a few minutes of this film and just be like yeah it's a satoshi khan movie <laughs> um which isn't isn't always a thing you get with directors um but it's some he has such a very he has a very de- defined visual style and way he manages to like move a film that it is just crazy to me. Yeah, and even compared to his most grounded film, uh, Tokyo Godfathers, yeah, Tokyo you could Godfather. still just clearly like grab <laughs> that it's the same mm-hmm. team, that it's the same guy thinking behind all of it. Yeah, and and I think that's really really neat. Yeah. And I think his career is just incredible. And yeah. <laughs> quite frankly, he is one of my favorite creators of all time. And yeah. I respect his work and his like what he wanted to do with his work so much. Um, absolutely man he was he was seemingly (laughs) a really really great guy and he did so much for the japanese animation world yeah and not even just on like a story writing level but he helped like essentially start the japanese animation union essentially (laughs) which is crazy he was one of the founding people yeah essentially like helped to get animators treated well thank goodness in japan yeah um and he just like even in his unfortunately very short life Mm -hmm. um has made just beautiful works of art yeah now i was about to say um if you asked me like what my favorite animated film was i would probably say paprika or spirited away (laughs) to to (laughs) japanese productions um and like man it's just such a it's it's such a moving and captivating work of art that I I, I I almost can't like imagine my like cinematic landscape in animation specifically um, without Paprika, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. But yeah. No. <laughs> Do you have anything else to really add? I feel like that's I, don't know. A, I feel yeah, like that's a pretty good I feel like that's a pretty natural There's so so up. so much yeah. you could talk about and I'm sure we've brushed over things we meant to get to. Absolutely, yeah. And you could i legitimately think you could spend like days on end <laughs> yeah. delving into this movie, i was about to talking about this we movie. didn't even talk about like the lighting or yeah, the oh, character animation man, there's dude just the cinematography the, or character the art animation. direction all that much oh <laughs> it's one of his most unique and like sharp like literally like edges wise uh-huh. sharp art directions in any of his work uh, it gives it a very distinct style, especially paired with this was his first film that wasn't um, cell animation. Yeah, I was about to say you get some um, 3D animation incorporated in this one and used to great effect, I think. Yeah, there's some really like even in that opening scene with mm-hmm. the clown cart that is like really visually interesting. Yeah, your brain is almost like, oh, what is like you immediately <laughs> are like, oh, this is like not quite right. Yeah. Um, and like the 3d confetti my god i can't get <laughs> i can't talk about this movie enough yeah. like seriously there's no way we could talk about everything involved. i was about to say I, I couldn't critique it or try and analyze it and do it justice um at the end of the day <laughs> yeah um so i like i said before at the beginning of uh, this segment like if you haven't seen paprika go watch it yeah. um unless you're not you know not i'm not going to tell you to go watch it if you're going to be uncomfortable with a lot of its content um yeah it does have again some pretty disturbing yeah content it's, in it's it. fairly disturbing and dark and i i completely understand if you don't want to watch it but um if you are interested in filmmaking or just movies or art in general or animation yeah or animation i cannot recommend yeah, this film can't enough. recommend it enough um, it's probably one of the best movies we've covered on the podcast honestly like seriously yeah and that's crazy to think about because this isn't even this is like number three in my <laughs> ranking of satoshi yeah, God's right you work. were like oh it's like it's number three it's not, not <laughs> number one no listen way. i could go off on perfect blue <laughs> for a long time too and i really need to I, I need to revisit perfect blue i feel like now that i've seen paprika for a second time that i like seeing perfect blue or millennium actress for a second time it's gonna like change my yeah, life I really, you know? well yeah I really think you need to give any of his films at least two watches to even just comprehend all of what they're going for. They're Um, just beautiful, man. But yeah, I mean, if anything, if any, if there's any takeaway (laughs) from this and you find this interesting at all, the big thing is like, go watch Satoshi Kon's work, especially this movie. Um, Paranoia Agent would be a big recommendation. Paranoia Agent is even darker and worse (laughs) content wise. Yes. So keep that in mind, but it is 
a masterpiece. Perfect Blue is the same way it is actually. Mm, uh, I would yeah. suggest it less to somebody who's yeah. not interested in especially disturbing sexual content. Yeah, I was about to say, I that would be the most hesitant I would be to, to recommend one of his movies to someone. It is obviously, I think, a very masterful movie, but I, I, I'm not going to go around being like, oh, you have to go watch Perfect Blue because I know that that <laughs> makes yeah. a lot of people very uncomfortable and they don't want to see it in their media. <laughs> and fair enough. It's a yeah, very, I was about to say, oof, more, more power it's to It's a heavy you. film. Yeah, it's a lot. Even for, even for for me i was like this is okay <laughs> this is a lot to take in <laughs> yeah but uh like seriously and yeah i've talked about satoshi khan as much as i can i was about to say i YouTube feel like um, a lot and... of a lot of his movies have come up during our what we watch segment even our last episode um we talked about paprika yeah briefly. and he's he he is legitimately just one of my favorite artists of all time yeah i, I didn't even talk about um <laughs> i just lost his name Right off the, right on the tip of my tongue. Oh darn it! Um, well, I don't know who's his, you're his about. like the composer, main oh, composer. Dude, the score for this! Uh, I didn't even mention the score. Oh my goodness, it's so good! Like the kind of like bubbling Susumi Hirasawa. Yeah, the kind of like bubbling digital um, facade of the score is so yeah, fitting. He Susumi Hirasawa was one of Satoshi Kon's <gasps> biggest influences for a lot of his work. He was a super influential like experimental Japanese artist mm -hmm. who worked with a bunch of different bands and then in Paranoia Agent uh, he got Dude, like Satoshi Kon got to work with Agent him <laughs> and then he came back for Paprika and his music is genuinely a work of art to pair mm -hmm. with the film yeah. what it's doing on a lot of levels again you could do an entire hour-long thing just about <laughs> the way the music also tells the story yeah and is implemented in really really impressive ways and just uses really unique music like music techniques i was about general. to say i have not heard a musical score for a film or even a lot of music which again i'm not the most uh, like in depth for electronic experimental stuff, but I haven't heard too much musically that sounds like the Paprika score. Well, in, in, and it fits the movie so well. In the Japanese like music industry, yeah. even in the American music industry, like uh, Susumi Hirasawa was like one of the forefronts of this kind of digital experimental music. Yeah, no, um, and it it sounds so good, <laughs> and it, it the way it, the score affects the tension of a lot of the moments and makes the kind of like facade of the movie work is it's it's crazy i don't know it's so good yeah but again <laughs> there's so many yeah. things and so many talented people who worked on this movie i know i've harped on satoshi khan yeah. a lot because he means so much to me uh but i mean that's not even touching the talent of like yeah everyone else who worked on this movie i was about to say they mentioned a lot of the like little subtleties and like um cool like visual tie-ins of the movie were thought of like as they were being animated yeah, yeah. and uh, again the animators of this uh I was did an amazing that, and, that, job. and that also goes to uh, yeah. not to tie everything credit wise to <laughs> satoshi khan but satoshi khan is a really good director and the fact that he really knows how to work with an animation team exactly he knows yeah. how to bring together people like i and said work he, with their talent he storyboards so intricately but manages to work in a lot of stuff that isn't like solely his which is crazy. I don't know. <laughs> Paprika is great. Go on. Uh, what, are, go watch what, are we, what are we even talking about at this point? Again, I gave this film a five out of five. As did I. Um, and yeah. every time I watched this movie so far, I've literally ended it just feeling a sense of awe and like a good, happy, hopeful, but darkly toned art filled sense of awe. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> makes, makes you want to go make something. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's Paprika. That's what we thought of the movie. Um, I suppose we should get into what we watched. Indeed. So for those of you who are new to the podcast or have just never made it this far, the What We Watched segment is a nice little thing that we do at the end where we talk about all of the movies we've watched since our last episode. Sometimes if we're nice and lazy, <laughs> it also is just a whole episode, <laughs> like right. the last episode we did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go listen to one of those, go listen to the last episode. But we took another week break, <laughs> so we're going all the way back to the 5th of June. So the 5th of June to June 19th. There you go. 
current day if you current will. day we're recording this on <laughs> juneteenth happy juneteenth yeah happy juneteenth guys my goodness i we oh forgot goodness. to mention it we forgot to mention what it. we did <laughs> i was gonna mention it here oh okay okay <laughs> uh but anyway let's get into it let's uh, do it why don't, why don't you start us off Ravi? what did you watch on the six uh i watched a little film by director ridley scott you it's might have a heard little, of a small little director little, little film. Oh, really... uh it's called the matchstick men or just matchstick men I, I think i should have it the in front of it i don't know it's just matchstick men. <laughs> just matchstick men uh but it has nicholas cage in it and sam rockwell and uh allison loman and they're a lot of fun there you go that it's it's basically just like a movie about the three of them uh mostly just nick cage and um great i just forgot her name allison loman which they're both really great and i think it's a really entertaining movie um it's it's like almost a heist movie which is pretty cool (laughs) um and like i don't know i think ridley scott is just a talented director and a lends a lot of energy to this which you know it's a bit unconventional compared to the other films i've seen from him uh, but I haven't seen really anything that's not a sci-fi film in his filmography, so this was interesting. It's a it's a nice like change of pace for his style of direction, and I enjoyed Nicolas Cage. He's nice. he's a really good actor. Who doesn't? One enjoy of my favorite Nicolas performances Cage. from him. Uh, I ended up giving it a five what out of the five. Heck? I that's probably a bit generous now. What the I would heck? probably give it a four out of five. Uh, <laughs> give it a five. Out I of did five, back when Robbie? I logged it. I think it's a perfect movie. I do not. Uh, that's why I said I would probably give it a four. Jeez. Um, <laughs> but it was very very good. Um, it's got a lot of great music in it. It's got some great performances. I don't know. It's good. It's fun. Let's go talk about it forever, I mean, Let's do a wow. whole episode on it at this point. <laughs> but yeah, Matt Stickman, I gave it a four out of five on an official rating. <laughs> what about you, Michael? What did you watch? Uh, on the sixth, <laughs> I watched a, a little film by a little known director, uh, Wong Kar Wai. Wong Kar Wai. Uh, I watched his film, Happy Together. Wow. Were they happy together, Michael? Uh, j- as as with all Wong Kar Wai <laughs> movies, only for a brief moment. <laughs> they were like almost happy to get. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Wong Kar Wai. It's like the third Wong Kar Wai film I've seen so far. I have the world of yes. Wong Kar Wai criteria. Yeah, because you've seen set, Fallen Angels and, and In the Mood for yeah, Love as well. I'm picking through them, working my way through them. <laughs> They're really, really fantastic so far, and uh, this was no exception. Very I nice. figured it was. I figured it was a fitting one to watch in June. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was very interesting. I really, really <laughs> like what it's doing. It's a shame that not as many people connect with this one as much, but I thought it was, I don't know, it was really interesting. I don't know if it was just because it's a gay couple, and I think it, he can explore a lot more interesting dynamics mm-hmm. and a relationship with that than what I'm used to. Doesn't from feel like, as boxed in kind of thing. Yeah, than what I'm used to from his very normal, just, you know, heterosexual couples yeah. that are in like all of his other movies. So it was very interesting to explore kind of that dynamic and also a lot of the cultural things it gets into because the production of the movie was very interesting and like filming in Argentina and stuff like that. It made I'm for, really excited for it. It made for a really, really unique film from him. And yeah. it's also gorgeous, of course. It's no like fallen angel level of gorgeous, <laughs> but it's still like a visual masterpiece on its own. Like it's just, it's amazing. Wong Kar Wai is an amazing director. Um, the cast is incredible and I think the story is really interesting and actually one of my favorites of his love stories I've seen so far. That's pretty cool. I, like I said, I'm really excited to check it out. I'm a big fan of Wong Kar Wai's movies, even though I've only seen one of them. (laughs) I gave it a four and a half out of five. Very nice. Very cool. Uh, the next day we sat down and we watched, uh, Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah. A rewatch for me. Uh, my first watch. Mr. Which, Al Pacino. I was about to say, you got Mr. Pacino here. Sidney Lumet. Uh, and yeah, it was my second Sidney Lumet film. Uh, and it's really, really good. He's such a talented director. <laughs> my goodness. It's crazy. I love this movie. <laughs> I really do. It's a great summer movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're... I mean, I, I what, what were you going to say? I was going to say, if it's June, it's a little <laughs> hot outside. It's a good, good month to do it for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Turn on Dog Day Afternoon. You might be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Um, I was just going to mention that his experience, like Sidney Lumet's experience as a theater director, once again, has kind of lent itself beautifully to a unique tone and 
like really cohesive performances from the entire cast of this. Yeah, especially being that like like using this for like it's it's a true story with mm-hmm. this cast and everything that was very very recent to when this happened. I think it was like three years yeah. the actual events happened, which is crazy to when they made the film. All of that stuff goes together and it makes it really, really unique and it's just really good. I think it's my favorite Al Pacino performance next to like the Godfather movies. Yeah, I it would be close, man. He's he's really good here. Man. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I love this movie. I gave it a five out of five. I also gave it a five out of five. It's just a it's just a really like well-made movie which again like i feel like i could you could say that about any of the sydney lumet films i've seen so he's just a talented director but yeah five out of five great movie then what did you watch Ravi? because you have several several things <laughs> on the eighth i watched uh eric andre's uh stand-up special that he did for netflix called legalize everything um <laughs> what to say about legalize everything <laughs> Uh, it kind of works. Uh, I gave it a positive score, but at, like at the end of the day, there's like some good bit, uh, bits mixed in with like a lot of just purposefully really grating stuff. Like, and that's, that's the whole style, yeah. which a lot of people I know, um, I haven't seen the Eric Andre show, um, but a lot of people I know who have and are like big fans of it say that his comedic style works a lot better in a narrative show form like in the talk show kind of atmosphere yeah. more so than trying to do a stand up set. And I, I think that that probably is the case because <laughs> his stand up was like, he'd shout something outrageous. He'd be like cocaine. And then like the audience would cheer and he'd be like, yeah, baby, <laughs> not like Austin powers, like, <laughs> but, but like, that's kind of the vibe. Like it was like really purposefully edgy. Like sometimes it would have some cool subtext, but like a lot of it's just meant to be, edgy for the sake of edgy and i didn't really enjoy it all that much when it was doing that yeah but it was still cool it's just very scattered i had i had a good time with it but i don't know if i'd watch it again yeah um but yeah i I ended up giving legalize everything a three out of five so not a great score but you know (laughs) not bad then what did you watch remy oh boy (laughs) you're gonna make me talk about it i'm gonna make you talk about Uh, it admit to watching it on live live television okay i watched this with my parents so i mean i did want to see it regardless but uh yeah i watched ghosted uh which is a 2023 uh romance action movie i guess uh it uh it has been uh probably pretty rightfully so kind of panned by a lot of letterbox users and a lot of my friends just generally think it kind of sucks as a movie um having just seen true lies which is kind of doing a very similar thing to this um which I, I ranted about how great True Lies was uh, a couple episodes ago. Um, or I guess it was last episode, actually. And uh, having that, like, James Cameron's such distinct and, like, uh, heartfelt, like, emotional core at the base of one of these, like, espionage comedy romance films, it just highlights everything that's wrong with <laughs> Ghosted <laughs> because it kind of lacks that identity and it kind of lacks that playful spirit that it really needs to work. I don't know. It it needed a much more cohesive direction. It it kind of feels like it wasn't directed by anybody, you know? Like it doesn't have a voice. I've heard heard people describe both its writing and direction as like could be it could have been an AI. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It just feels very um, voiceless. Like the material itself isn't that like on the surface bad. It's just none of it made me feel or a certain way at all. (laughs) Like I was just kind of it was just kind of a flat experience of a film like nothing's especially wrong with it but nothing really is good about it either so it kind of ends up just feeling like a waste of time (laughs) um i ended up giving it a two out of five which is one of my lowest ratings i've handed out in a while um yeah you've been giving everything fives for anything if he vaguely likes the movie he's like i I know okay i'm going through and re-rating a bunch of stuff (laughs) recently um (laughs) And this, I, I don't know, I'd probably, I'd probably keep this out of two. It would be a hesitant two, though. It, it is pretty just uninteresting, which is a shame, because I really like the lead cast. Like, um, Chris Evans and Anna de Armas are both, like, very talented actors, and, like, you know, they can do good stuff. They're just, there's not much here, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, Ghosted, not, not great. 
Yeah, and on the ninth, uh, I watched uh, Emperor, the Emperor's New Groove. The Emperor's uh, New Groove, and I I turned this on. Uh, I've been I've been teaching, <laughs> and like I teach summer camps and good like I, I teach most of the year anyway. Yeah. But uh, I was teaching a class, and it was the last day of our camp, and people were mostly done. <laughs> so it was a fun little thing. We were gonna we were gonna turn on a movie, and I decided to turn on this one. So I kind of like half watched this because I still had to go around and like help people with their questions yeah, yeah. and like you know control a classroom <laughs> of twenty four kids. Just a lot, um, <laughs> especially for that age group, man. Yeah, but uh, they still like it's the the magic of movies in a classroom, man. They can be <laughs> really like loud and like especially on the last day, they got a lot of energy, and then you turn on a movie and they're like dead quiet now <laughs> <laughs> which is always really funny but yeah. the emperor's new groove is a fantastic movie it's really funny it's, so it's a classic fun. yeah it was actually really kind of heartwarming to me personally to see that a bunch of people who were quite a bit younger than me like were still like knew a lot of the quotes and the bits <laughs> and still laughed at the movie a bunch yeah. like it's i don't know a very timeless comedy um even though it's a very like it's very two thousands in my opinion. Right. No, it's it's very much a two thousands movie, but <laughs> it manages to feel very timeless, like in its in how enjoyable it is. Yeah. So that was cool. I give it a four and a half. <laughs> yeah. That's a good movie, man. Uh then on the tenth, I went out to the theater. The theater. Uh me me and my girlfriend went on a date. The cinema and oh part of the date <laughs> included uh going to the cinema to watch the hit new movie uh the boogeyman the boogeyman Ooh. not john wick chapter four <laughs> just the boogeyman. just the boogeyman Ooh. and unfortunately for the boogeyman though i guess i didn't have too high hopes for the boogeyman right i was about to say um, you kind of seemed like hesitantly uh like just kind of assuming it would be mediocre yeah i mean i did assume you, it we saw the trailers and it was pretty it was fine yeah it's pretty okay it's just so it's very very similar to smile <laughs> and i think smile just felt so much more creatively exciting mm. than this especially like with this being based on something and coming out like it's so similar in plot to smile you could break down <laughs> the plot to end the, of smile in this and it would just be laughably similar um so like it's pretty much just smile to electric boogaloo. Nice. Um, <laughs> that sounds like a good time, Micah. <laughs> the cast is pretty fun, but it's it, again, it's just not doing much of anything like yeah. unique, which is fine. It was still fun to go see in theaters, especially with Haley. But like, again, just go watch Smile. Smile's better. <laughs> uh, but I gave it a three out of five. Very cool. Uh, then we sat down and we watched uh, Jurassic Park. Bow, bow, rather rewatched for like the upteenth bow, time. Bow. This it was, was my thirtieth anniversary. Yeah, it was the thirtieth anniversary of Jurassic Park. This was my eighth time logging it. This so my, my ninth time viewing this it. This was probably. my twelfth time logging it, and probably like my twentieth <laughs> time viewing it. <laughs> Yeah, it was co really cool seeing this after watching uh, Jurassic World Dominion and The Fablemans, because I feel like that gives you a whole new perspective as to like where the franchise went and where Spielberg kind of went and came from. Yeah, I mean, The Fablemans gives you kind of an appreciation <laughs> yeah. for like so much of Spielberg's work. But yeah. this is just a masterpiece. I was about to say, it's just a cool new lens that uh, like on a movie that I've looked at for so long. <laughs> It's, you know? this, this is a technical marvel. It's yeah. insanely fun, insanely Dude, it's rewatchable. It's a blast, man. The cast is incredible. <laughs> the effects, yes. well, sometimes look aged, look still astonishingly Dude, good for the, 1993. I was about to say, we watched the 4K, and it, it's still sometimes kind of hard to distinguish what's CGI and what's animatronic. Exactly, because they blended it so yeah. well. It's it's just really impressive. I love and I amazing. love the puppet work and animatronics in this movie so much. Like even if it was just a garbage film, I would <laughs> I would enjoy it probably just for its puppeteering and stuff. Jurassic Park it's is, so cool. is the best. Didn't Phil Tippett work on this movie? Uh yeah. 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 Dude, he rocks. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah. He's the best. He's like the most talented puppeteer <clears throat> in the world, probably. Yeah, definitely top tier Spielberg. That's not a hot take by any means. Um, I've had plenty of time to sit with Jurassic Park. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's amazing. It's so, so good. Five out of five. Obviously. Five out of five, yeah. Obviously. <laughs> was was that even a question? Was it even a question? Uh, then on the 12th, what did you watch, Remy? I watched another stand-up special. Uh, I watched this one over Discord How on original, YouTube. Remy. How original. <laughs> over Discord. Another, another stand-up special. On YouTube. It's called uh, So My Wife... Dot, dot, dot. Like, there's a... 
dot dot dot. Little, little yeah. dot dot dot. But it's so there's my a, wife. There's a, there's a term for that, Revy. A dot dot. El- dot. Ellipsis. Ellipses. Ellipses. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, it's from a comedian named Finn Taylor. He's British. Uh, I missed maybe like five or six of the jokes because they were British things. <laughs> um, but I watched it with Luke, which um, if you're familiar with like our guests that we've had on in the past. Friend, friend of the podcast. Yeah, friend of the podcast, Luke. Uh, I watched it with him on Discord and it was a lot of fun. We got to laugh and cry and, you know, we shared a very heartfelt conversation. <laughs> about, 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 f- about this man's wife. Yeah. <laughs> I so, so my wife. <laughs> No, I I thought it was as a special like pretty. <laughs> I just thought of the John Mulaney thing. Oh my gosh, <laughs> my wife. My wife. <laughs> yeah. What kind of special would that be? <laughs> but yeah, um, as a comedy special, I thought it was pretty good. Um, there's a lot of really good bits um, mixed in with just some, you know, whatever. Like they they make you laugh, but then you kind of forget about them, kind of things. So I ended up giving it a three out of five, just because it's not visually very interesting it's like two static shots for most of it um and the jokes were you know they're pretty good but not like amazing not enough to pull it up from a three in my eyes so yeah (laughs) so my wife by finn taylor uh then on the 12th i watched for the very first time uh american psycho american psycho Um, and i and i inadvertently turned on the uncut version (laughs) or the unrated version i mean um, which was an interesting thing to stumble upon having never seen American Psycho. Uh, but I really, really loved American Psycho. Dude, I've, I've I'd, been waiting to see that movie I'd, for so long. I, didn't, I need to. I didn't know how I would feel about it, but I really, it's, especially the more I've sat with it, it's just so much fun. It's so funny. <laughs> and it's a really, really, like, it's just so effective at what it's trying to do. I think it can be a little bit hard to get through, especially if you don't personally connect with it, because Patrick Bateman is just such a difficult character to follow as a protagonist for the entire, like, the entirety of the movie, because he's just, like, there's not a single element you can empathize with him, and it's not, like, a short movie. It's not, like, super long, but you're, you know, you're with this... It's not, like, a breezy like watch you're with this like unbearable (laughs) trash human uh for like 90 percent of the movie (laughs) actually 100 percent of the movie but it's like him narrating all of this stuff and it can be a little bleak yeah to just like not even like it's not a bleak movie it's a very funny movie but like it could just be a lot to get through for an entire length of a movie i get that uh but the satire and the comedy is is really fantastic Dude, everything i've seen from that movie looks hilarious the horror scenes are really really fun <laughs> yeah um the chainsaw chase scene is really really good i loved that um obviously christian bale's performance is just incredible this is like his best performance easily having seen equilibrium which is about the same time in his career i'm really excited to watch it <laughs> and yeah it's so much fun in that and again i still find it very very funny that this was like written and directed by a woman and it was actually written <laughs> by two women so like it's it's a very it is just really it's funny, funny how like given the weird yeah. reputation of people who completely misunderstood the movie i was about <laughs> to say the fan base that it has it's like letterboxed core kind of movie <laughs> <laughs> and it's very like, funny again like it's the whole thing where people have unironically posted women can't understand american psycho right. when it's a movie written and directed by women <laughs> yeah it just it just adds to the to the comedy i think <laughs> uh but yeah i gave it a four and a half out of five it was really fantastic very nice very nice uh on the 13th comedy i sat down freaking comedy specials did you watch Other comedy specials. these aren't even movies rabbi but i okay this one's important enough that i want to shout it out like you could have skipped oh, so oh you could have you you spent so long I'm talking sorry. about it <laughs> i had fun with a friend watching it my god is that a crime it is a crime wow. you're under arrest <laughs> um but i watched uh hannah gadsby's uh stand-up special nanette 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 Nanette. Uh, and it's like one of the most moving and like well formed and well written and like thematically rich stand up specials that I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, it's probably like the best one. I don't know if it would be my favorite just because like, 
you know, for like the latter half of it, it's not as focused. Like making you laugh is not its main goal for like the back half of it. Yeah. Um, but it still manages to be really funny and like it's really moving and it's it's a beautiful piece, um, regardless of whether or not like it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's really great. Uh, definitely go watch it if you are old enough to watch uh, TV mature uh, stand up <laughs> special. Um, can't recommend it enough. It's, it's one of the most moving pieces I've seen. Um, that's just basically someone standing on a stage talking for <laughs> an hour. Uh, but yeah, Nanette, uh, I ended up giving it a five out of five. It would be a hesitant rating if I were to keep it that same thing. It would, it would either be a four or a five though. It's, it's really fantastic. Can't nice, recommend it enough. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, we watched, uh, we finally, finally sat down and watched Missing. Missing. Yeah. The, the, the gang we've talked about. We did, we did a whole episode on we did, searching. We did an episode way on back searching when. and we did an episode on run. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which are all from the same writing team. Yeah. From Sevo Hanan and Anish Chakati. Great, great writers. Some of, some of my favorite writers working today. They just make really fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and this time they they went out there uh this time it was not either of them directing nope uh, unlike searching um pretty much first time directors i think yeah no they um, are and doing the same style technically in the same universe <laughs> as searching which yeah. is very interesting and could be very bad but in fact it's not bad yeah um i mentioned i i think really it kind of feels a bit more theatrical than Missing does. Yeah, it like feels both like they in got its the performance, style down yeah, better. in its performances, which do feel a bit more like uh, big than Searching's performances do. Searching has pretty understated performances for a lot of the movie. Dude, I've been loving Storm Reed's performances. She's getting a lot, yeah. more, like a lot more roles lately. Storm Reed is great in this, um, but yeah, like it has a has a more bombastic acting style and direction, and also like its visual style, like you said, is a bit more evolved from what we see in Searching, which is great. I think they learned from a lot of the like kind of mistakes not necessarily like mistakes, just a lot of the it was their first of time the, around yeah in searching i was about to say a lot of kind of the bumps that you get in a pretty much brand new form of like movie making yeah i think i think my only thing if i had a complaint about this movie uh -huh. versus the other one is that it feels very much like it goes through a lot of the same motions as the other movie even having like they do they do some twists with it obviously but for like the first there's half, like three plot it feels twists. like it feels like you're practically doing the same story as yeah. uh, just like a reverse no i get that for like the first half of the movie which i was kind of disappointed in and they you know they twist it, it works around. past they, that. they get the mystery going they get a lot of um really fun dynamics between some of the side characters yeah and but Storm i was, I was about character. to say but it really effectively handles its characters yeah and yet again it doesn't feel like a gimmick at all. it's super engaging for this kind of thriller mystery oh yeah and <laughs> i would suggest this over searching i really genuinely I yeah i liked this more than searching i was about to say i would suggest this over searching and run i think um, yeah really fantastic yeah it's just it's a really like captivating thriller with like some really invented visuals and fun like sequences it's great <laughs> it's a good time man i gave it a four and a half out of five i give it a four out of five it's it's rock solid man i love it <laughs> Uh, uh, then on the 14th, yeah, the 14th, I sat down and I wanted to watch a really good movie. <laughs> so I gathered around uh, my TV. The TV, baby. And watched Nope again. Because I had been, you know, you got to watch Nope more times. Nope. People need to go watch I Nope. Need, I haven't rewatched Nope since I saw it in the theater. Nope I is need to so see it again. <laughs> good. And, you know, seeing it at home isn't as fun, especially being that, like, I need to watch but it with people, headphones. People dude. started cooking while I was like yeah. towards the end of the movie, and like ninety percent of this movie is sound. I'm sorry, dude. Uh, I had to make an omelet. <laughs> it was pressing. <laughs> but uh, still, what a what a movie! I genuinely think this is a masterpiece. So much of the visuals and the audio, like just the filmmaking, the audio design, the performances. Daniel Kaluuya and Kiki Palmer are incredible dude, in this. Steven Yeun is amazing in this. Yes. Like it's genuinely a super smart really fun super rewatchable super tight film i would i would hesitantly call it jordan peele's best because i would just because peele's best. get out is so so good get out is like a masterpiece of a screenplay yeah but i would still say this is his i best. was about to say as a filmmaker this is definitely his best one i gave it a five out of five <laughs> Yeah, I didn't watch it, but I I would have given it. <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs> then on the sixteenth, oh wait, you have something. Yeah, on the 15th. I watched something oh, on the fifteenth, oh, baby. Oh. 
watching good movies over here. <laughs> Maybe. Is it a good movie, Raymond? Uh, I watched uh, Maltesta's Carnival of Blood, which is a almost no-budget 70s... Uh, it's not quite a slasher, but it's a horror movie. It's not quite a slasher, but it's not quite anything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, like I said, it's almost no-budget. They use like a bunch of bubble wrap and like gooey fake blood and tin foil and cardboard for the set dressing <laughs> um but they somehow managed to make like a really captivating atmosphere they use lighting really well in that movie um the way it's shot is really compelling the performances are fun uh it's got a fun like side cast um just like a lot of the monster stuff is cool like it's take on like zombies and cannibals and vampires which all of which are featured in the movie um like it feels unique and distinct and it all feels like it blends very well as like a universe it's very it's it's a very cool movie by all accounts <laughs> um and the way it, it manages to like reference a lot of like dawn of horror film kind of films like it has a lot of visual homages to those which is probably why it's as visually sharp as it is is because it's pulling from a lot of like 30s and 20s yeah, yeah. horror stuff um but it's really cool it has like awesome homages it has fun production design cool art direction uh yeah it's just it's a fun movie i wanted it to just be like more I don't know, more exciting almost. Like it, it, it is one of those plots where like it's a mystery and it slowly reveals stuff. But like a lot of the middle of this movie just doesn't really reveal anything. It's just people like getting killed and like getting scared. Like Texas so, Chainsaw, but without the saw. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you, it, and it really just centers around like a few characters. So like, it's just them like walking lo from location to location, like talking to people and then something scary happens and then they walk to the next location, like that sort of thing. Well, that's low budget for you. Yeah, exactly. So like it, it was really cool to a certain degree, but also I wanted it to be a lot more engaging than it was. Um, I would probably watch it again just for fun. Like it was a, it was a good time, but I ended up giving it a three out of five. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't like recommend it to everyone on the street kind of things but it was fun it's called a uh, maltesta's carnival of blood very good then on the 16th i watched wally -E, this time with another one of my camps it wow. was a robotics camp so watching wally -E at the end was fun you can't watch wally -E at a robotics camp micah that's that's too on the nose <laughs> <laughs> and i forgot how visually fun wally -E is like it's yeah, a very dude. unique for pixar especially looking movie yeah pulls off kind of this weird pseudo photo reel <laughs> paired with actual human actors aesthetic really really well. i always forget that there's like actual people like a live action footage until it happens and I'm, it like blends really well yeah, with the it movie blends for so some well like it's seamless practically <laughs> which is very impressive for the it's style so that weird. they're going for especially in 2008 yeah um but yeah very fun i give it a four and a half out of five it's wally um, yeah then also on the 16th i watched uh martin scorsese's cape fear cape fear uh, one of the few Scorsese movies I haven't seen yet, or hadn't seen yet, I should Ooh. say. Um, and it was really, really good. I didn't know what to expect from it. And it's like surprisingly super Scorsese, but also <laughs> being like weirdly like super like 90s horror feeling. I mean, it's like it's one of his earlier movies. Yeah. No, I mean, it was in the 90s. Yeah. That's like three decades into his work. Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just used to like 2010 Scorsese in my mind. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, it's very interesting. Uh, it's really fun. It feels very, like, timeless almost. It's very... It strikes me as kind genre. of like a... It strikes me as kind of like a misery thing where it feels like a classical kind of movie. Yeah. Um, Robert De Niro's performance in it is really, really interesting. <laughs> like, it's not even, like the greatest thing in the world he's doing this weird accent for the whole movie but yet he's a really really engaging and like threatening character to watch interesting it's a very good tense movie and yeah i don't know it's really fun very cool um i wanted to mention something because i got to go to a screening that night and i got to like sit down and watch a movie with francis ford coppola in the theater which was awesome <laughs> i can't i can't really say much else that doesn't but... that doesn't break your nda does it no okay uh, well micah um on the email that i got sent like that was sent out to everyone it says uh, francis ford coppola screening and that he'll be there to introduce yeah, the film yeah yeah so i yeah i got to go to the theater 
Um, I had to sign an NDA, but I got to go to the theater and I got to see Francis Ford Coppola in person. He seems really cool. <laughs> um, and then he sat like behind me while we were watching the movie. So it was, it was awesome. It was a really fun night, but I didn't log what I watched. Um, for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but yeah. I, I gave Cape Fear a four and a half out of five. Very cool. Uh, then also on the 16th, uh, I tuned in to the very first episode of Black Mirror. I had never Black seen it before, Mirror. so I watched Black Mirror, the National Anthem. Um, there you go. And Zooey Mama. <laughs> Zooey Mama. The Micah's official review of <laughs> the first episode of Black Mirror, oh, Zooey Mama. Especially now that I've seen more episodes, <laughs> this is a wild way to open the show, to say the least. Very British. Um, one of the most disturbing <laughs> episodes of television I've seen, which is an interesting achievement. <laughs> Made me very sick to my stomach. I'm, which is I'm an really excited, dude. I, um, I, you got me really like interested in how it like is actually going to be to watch it you know yeah it's not a i didn't give the episode a like because <laughs> it wasn't a pleasant experience. like it's like i don't know if i like the but movie. it certainly was an experience and a well done experience so i gave it a three and a half out of five i thought it was a very interesting pretty much i mean they're black mirror episodes are essentially little movies yeah so i mean a uh, half of them are feature length so <laughs> yeah i rated them all and ranking them and such but i gave that one a three and a half um, out of five, probably will not watch it again, <laughs> though. Fair. So that's, fair. <laughs> that's something. Yeah. Uh, then what did we watch on the 17th, Rebbe? On the 17th, we went out to the theater and we watched The Blackening. Heck yeah. It was a lot of fun. I, I didn't really know, like, fully what to expect from it, um, just because I hadn't really seen, like a black, like, a person of color, like, that sort of thing centered horror movie before. Besides, like, Get Out, I guess, but that doesn't really, like, like that's technically not the same thing. Um, but this is actually, like, about black culture and black history, like, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, and not only that, but weirdly enough, it's from the director of the Fantastic Four movies. <laughs> yeah, and Tim the really, the really, really bad Tom and Jerry movie <laughs> that came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, we covered, I was about to say, we covered Tim Story's last movie, Tom and Jerry. <laughs> and Tom and Jerry was an absolute train wreck. It was a terrible film. Um, but this the was really fun. Yeah. Um, I, it was funny. Dude. I consistently had a smile on my face. I think yeah, it was man. engaging. I think I had an interesting mystery. It wasn't the scariest thing in the world. It wasn't no. the most interesting thing in the world. It wasn't the most exciting thing but in the world. But it has a fun ensemble, dude. Yeah, but it's got a really fun <laughs> ensemble, and it's doing something just really enjoyable, kind yeah. of in the vein of something like uh, Bodies, 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 yeah. where I don't think it's like the greatest movie in the world, but it is genuinely a really fun movie to be watching. I was about to say, I think in quality, the blackening is very similar to Bodies, 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 and like in general premise, it's in just... In tone and everything. Yeah, in yeah. tone and everything. It's just covering a different uh, like type of person like bodies 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 is like a different type of person no right? no not like that dang it crap why does this always happen no like a different demographic kind of thing it's like touching on different themes yeah yeah exactly that's what i that's what i meant my goodness different cultural themes yeah the, exactly the, the one a different culture bodies, bodies bodies is specifically supposed to be about gen x yeah like gen x like rich gen x kids is what it's okay, meant not to gen be. x uh, Gen Z. Yeah, like rich Gen Z people. Gen X is the generation before millennials. I oh, think. shoot. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I yeah. Getting, my, getting my weird generation. Oh, my what, goodness. What is it, who names the generation? <laughs> it's really annoying. Uh, but yes. And then this one is specifically about, especially like like black horror movies, essentially. Yeah. And they're really like, you know, black cast members relationship to the history of horror and they have a little, it's like a Juneteenth celebration. Yeah. Thing. So that was cool to watch, headed up to Juneteenth. That was fun. I was about to say, it's a really good movie, guys. I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> my biggest, my biggest uh, heart, heartbreaking thing in the movie was that it wasn't actually a 2023 movie, so I couldn't put it on <laughs> my 2023 list, ranked. Yeah. Darn you. <laughs> yeah. But I give it a four out of five. I also give very, it a four out of five. It was really fun, yeah. Uh, then on the 18th... Um, well, <laughs> technically the first was on the night of the 17th, but I'll try and be brief with this. Okay, okay. Because uh, I watched like four other Black Mirror episodes and I do want to <laughs> talk about them. Uh, yeah, but... Blackening is the last movie I watched. So. Yeah, so on the, well, really late in the night on the 17th, <laughs> I watched Black Mirror, The Entire History of You. 
Um, hey, hey. Very interesting. I think it was a little bit more like what I would have expected from Black Mirror going into it. Not like the national anthem definitely was not what I was expecting. <laughs> uh, but the entire history of you is, seems like a very Black Mirror esque premise. But at the same time, I think it, I wish it was just longer. I wish they were given <laughs> more time because I feel like this has some interesting ideas, but doesn't fully get a chance to explore them. And it can even come off as a little contrived with the story it's doing, despite mm. being like really like it's still well written. And I think it's interesting. And I think the performances are good. Um, but it just feels like it has like this weird necessity to go far faster than it needs to. Interesting. Um, uh, I mean, that that makes sense like given the fact that it's an entry at a tv show yeah you know but i still really enjoyed it a lot and i think it was even more solid than the national anthem overall mm. um just as an en- enjoyable episode because <laughs> i don't know i i feel like maybe i should up my rating on the national anthem because like it's genuinely a super memorable episode of television <laughs> and it is like well made yeah um but yeah the entire history of you was interesting and definitely brings a tonal shift compared to the national anthem. <laughs> uh, I give it a four out of five. There you go. Then I watched Black Mirror Be Right Back, Be right which back. is so far my favorite episode of the show that I've seen. Hey, hey. Um, Haley Atwell and I don't know how to say his name. Dom, Dahomnal, Dom, Homnal. I, I, yeah, no, I'm not sure. I don't know. It's the guy who plays Hux in Star wow. Wars. That's my, that's my uh, touchstone for him. Domhnall Gleeson, I assume. Yeah, something like Domhnall, Domhnall, something like that. Gleeson. Yeah. Um, very, very fun actor. I really yeah, do like his work. I just don't know how to pronounce his first He always name. makes me smile whenever he comes, <laughs> like whenever he shows up and something, I'm like, yeah. But they're so good as leads of this. I think that's really one of the things that gives this so much juice is they're just really, like they're pretty much the only characters in the whole episode and they're really, really good and they have great chemistry. And I think the idea is really interesting, especially like dealing with some things that are pretty recent coming into a thing that is kind of actually there Mm. which is fun and i think although that's not the point of the show still adds an interesting layer to the show well also uh i'm trying to be brief with these (laughs) the episode was just really emotional and i think has a really beautiful story to tell inside of it uh and i cried because i think it was a really actually genuinely emotionally good episode which was something i think lacking a bit from the other two in my opinion Micah, you were just sitting there, you were like, this is worthy of crying, <laughs> and then you cry. Exactly. That's how I made exactly. it sound. That's how I, that's how I, how I cry at movies. I'm like, does this deserve my tears? I was, you're like, I, I believe it's a emotionally <laughs> moving story, like, so, so much so that I would even cry at it. <laughs> I gave it a four and a half out of five. It's, yeah. again, my favorite episode so yeah. far. Uh, then I also watched Black Mirror White Bear. White Bear. Uh, weird episode. Baby. Not really too much to say about it. Um, a lot of the elements I didn't really like because of <laughs> mainly having to do with, like, the twist of the episode, so I won't say it. Mm, but, like, I don't it, know what it is. It led to the episode feeling kind of cheaper, like, in production than a lot of the other mm. episodes. And I just didn't really attach myself to any of the characters. I think it poses an interesting moral question. So that's something. But it's not really enough, like, meat to really make it an interesting, like, thing. Like, if this was a movie and not an episode of a television show, which this is, like, the shortest episode, I think, of, like, practically the whole show. Oh, wow, yeah. So it's the most, like, show episode feeling <laughs> of any of them. Uh, if this was, like, a movie, I would be like, wow, that was kind of a waste of time. Oh, um, interesting okay but it's still really good i was about to say you gave it the same rating as national anthem yeah you know it's hard to rate things it so is yeah ratings are arbitrary nonsense Mike. i rate it what i feel like rating it uh <laughs> and i gave it a three and a half it yeah. was still re- like that's the thing i still had fun with it and mm-hmm. i still think it's engaging and asks an interesting question yeah and it's shorter runtime is probably a good thing because I don't think this premise could have been dragged in the way they were doing it out yeah. longer. Yeah. Um, so I still think it was like an effectively well-made story. Um, 
And then I watched uh, Black Mirror, the Waldo moment. The Waldo moment. <laughs> Very Maybe. weird episode. I still had a lot of fun with this. And I like, I like, I appreciate that the episode is genuinely trying to be funny. Like Waldo isn't funny and like clearly, but like there is actually like funny writing in the dialogue. Is, of it, the episode. is it like meant to be more comedic than the other ones? Yeah, that you'd it's seen definitely, so far? it's definitely meant to be more comedic than that's, any, that's any other fun. episode. That's I, I was so scared. Like I have, I haven't seen any of Black Mirror, but part Part of my like hesitation to watch it is I didn't want to just watch like this super self serious thing all the time. Yeah, no, and I think this movie or this episode takes itself just like unseriously enough to That's really good. make it work. Yeah. Again, I uh, there were different points throughout of just like normal conversations, yeah. not Waldo stuff that I was like, <laughs> "That's funny," and like there were clearly intentional jokes written into the dialogue. Yeah, I know a lot of my friends find Waldo really annoying. Well, Waldo is really annoying. Yeah, he's like the worst, uh, and. It's not the most engaging episode, and really it has one of my least favorite things that any of these episodes have done, and White Bear did the same thing, Mm. Um, where, like, it's getting to the, like, crescendo of the music, like, I mean, not the music, of the the story, story, and then it just cuts (laughs) to kind of give dramatic effect, and it's, like, directed by, and then it flashes to (laughs) another, like, epilogue clip, Mm. and then it pops up another written by, and then does another epilogue clip, and, like, the white white bear and the Waldo moment just kind of undercuts all the dramatic tension that it had built up to. That's kind of lame, and especially in the Waldo moment, it cuts, like, so far ahead of the events, (laughs) and, like, so drastically, with such a, like, easily the stupidest premise of any of the episodes <laughs> that it just really kind of makes it feel a lot cheaper mm. uh, like you're watching a much stupider show than any of the other episodes have made you feel yeah um but i gave it a three out of five <laughs> there you go then then on the 19th oh my today goodness. don't worry guys it's not a black oh mirror episode <laughs> today on the 19th, uh, I watched Miss Juneteenth. Um, hey. Because I was looking for a Juneteenth movie to watch, and it turns out there was a, like, literally a pretty directly Juneteenth movie. So I watched seems, it. Seems rare to find. Right? Again, I'm, I'm glad to see, like, the rise of Juneteenth yeah, as more I was about of, like, to say, a this was, holiday Yeah, this recently. was in 2020, and I mean, yeah. uh, the blackening is set on Juneteenth, yeah. and that was, a, you know, 2022, 2022 yeah. so... You know, it's cool. hopefully we'll get more. I was about to say, I want to see that trend continue, please. Uh, but Miss Juneteenth was a pretty fine movie. I think it's got pretty good filmmaking, pretty decent direction. It's got a female director, so that's cool. Oh, cool. Um, but it's it's a pageant movie, and I've seen a lot of pageant <laughs> movies, and it just feels very, very baseline pageant movie. Yeah. They still pair it thematically well and tie everything into like an interesting thing with Juneteenth and very much make it an interesting story about, like, you know being black in america yeah which i think is is like interesting and unique but at the same time it very much is just going through the motions of a pageant film and it's like oh i wonder <laughs> what will happen next Ooh, it happened yeah it just, like it just feels a bit paint by the numbers yeah it just feels very basic even yeah. in, even in its filmmaking while i really appreciate like the way it's shot it's shot in a very kind of down-to-earth intimate kind of feeling way it's still not quite engaging it's enough not in enough, its cinematography yeah. it's very like it's like it's trying to do that and then it still ends up being kind of plain looking like it's never it never is fully rising above what i what i wish it would yeah um but still very fun and like really good for its own merits it's not trying to be anything more than what it is which i think makes it work really well yeah um and the two leads are really really great um that's enough it, to sell it man i gave it a three and a half out of five very cool and that is all I want. Yeah. Um, again, go watch the blackening in theaters if you can. Yeah, support that. I was about to say support that because it has like an all black uh, crew almost. Yeah. And it rocks. <laughs> so um, go watch that while it's still in theaters. Um, go watch Paprika as yeah, well. Yeah, go watch Paprika. It's a very good movie. Uh, <laughs> go watch. Heck, go watch Across the Spider Verse. Yes. Rep, rep that movie. Yes. Uh, uh, and we'll catch you guys next week with probably Prometheus, I think. Eh? Yeah? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because we did Resurrection, then Prometheus is next. Okay. Sure. <laughs> We're doing Prometheus <laughs> next week. I've decided it. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.